on, posting broadcast video to the public. Broadcast video is live. Okay. Okay. Um, chat me if you can't uh, if you can't find it. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm sure I'll, I'll see. Uh, so I'm okay. Popping okay, great. And then you can pop in when when Alex leaves. Okay. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, I'm currently in a hotel in Seattle. Um, there may be a maintenance guy knocking on my door in a little bit, so I apologize if I have to break off for about five minutes. Um, uh, but I wanted to get started here. Um, okay, can everybody see the agenda for today? It's posted under under the apps uh, link. If you go to the apps, you should see two documents, and one of them is is agenda. Anybody see that? Yes. We should have access. Uh. Okay. So I'm hoping everybody saw that. Okay, so we'll we'll get started. I um I have a few updates and just wanted to uh to, to go around a little bit and talk about a couple things. Okay, one is that you'll notice there's a there's a new face here. Uh his name is Stephen Cook. Um, I don't think we have time to go a full round of introductions with everybody now because we are kind of a large group, but I thought I'd at least have him introduce himself uh, to us and, uh, and have him say a little bit about his background and, and what he's doing. He and I have actually had a lot of uh, email exchange here in the last week very, very rapidly and fortuitously, um, and it and, uh, looks like some exciting developments coming out of that. So, Steve, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, um, everyone. I'm not sure. Is my microphone working just fine? Yeah. Yep. We can hear you. Yeah, I'm Steve. I'm currently a graduate student in the Emmons Lab at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. We're working on reconstruction of the male C. Elgin's nervous system currently. It's the main project of the lab. We just finished up doing the posterior nervous system and we're currently working on the anterior. Um, part of this project, though, is reconstructing historical data sets used to do Mind of the Worm, which is white at all, 1986. So we've been looking at the historical EMs and new EMs that we collected. Um, we have several databases now, different worms that have XYZ coordinates for neuron profiles in addition to synapses. So the previous data just have number of synapses to determine the weight of connectivity between neurons. We have that marked now as the number of serial sections where the synapse is present in addition to uh, locations other than just the maps that you can see that they have on either a worm image or worm atlas for the mind of the worm. So we have a lot of connectivity data that we're still generating and we're starting to analyze it, but we're looking to share it and to make it public and see what, all we can get out of it. This is very cool. And you want to tell the group real quick how it is that you uh, found uh, this project? Well, I actually found this. I actually found this project originally through Craigslist. So John White, the guy who did Mind of the Worm, was my undergraduate PI, and I was looking for a job. And I found my started as a tech, now a grad student, and I found the advertisement on Craigslist. So I was like, Oh, what the hell? I'll go back to worms and just do what my advisor did 30 years ago. Nice. And how, how about this? How about the Open Worm project? How did you find the Open Worm project? Um, I found it. I don't know. I think just through Wormbase, maybe. I think that are there some Wormbase links right now. There are, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. that's probably where I found it. Cool. Great. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the plans that we're sort of trying to put into place here um, mm -hmm. towards the end of the process. So let's see, there's my uh, there's my hotel. All right, uh, give me. Okay, great. So, um, all right, made them go away. Great. Okay, so so thanks for introducing yourself. Um, so we'll, like I said, we'll talk more about uh, what we're planning here a little bit later. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is um, over the last uh, couple weeks, um, Andre, Sergey, and myself have been working to try to um, respond to reviewer comments on the original Cyber Elegans publication. So that's the second point. Ah, there's Andre now. Okay, great. Um, hi, Andre. Andre. Hi everybody, nice to meet you. 
all sort of um, uh, message and uh, conversation. Very good. I was just uh, check out the agenda on the uh, on the apps link uh, there, Andre. Mm -hmm. I was just I was just talking about uh, our publication work uh, over the last week, um, and uh, in responding to reviewer comments for the original Cyber Elegans. And one of the things uh, that they uh, wanted to be sure to have was a download of the executable and the source code to be able to review the paper pro appropriately. So that's been posted. Um, on the OpenWorm downloads, and if you see the agenda, I've, I've linked to it there. Uh, it's in a .rar file. Um, so um, inside that RAR is both the executable and under the PRJ directory, the source code for the original Cyber Elegans, uh, actually updated Cyber Elegans. I think that, uh, that uh, they made some additional updates on it. So uh, it's compiled for Windows right now. Uh, so you can check it out. It's quite nice. Um, and uh, hopefully the revisions that we made are going to get that through there. I, uh, I, I did some uh, editing of it, and so I threw myself on as a middle author, um, but I decided to make my affiliation uh, the Open Worm Project, just because, hey, why not? And it's not like uh, you know, UCSD is, uh, is funding this project anyway. So, um, so for now, I think I'll just go on as, uh, as the Open Worm Project. So hopefully that gets through. Hopefully we get through the reviewers and... Um, uh, thanks to Andre and Sergey for giving me the opportunity to try and uh, and try to help them out with that. Um, I know that it's been a painful, long process to get this paper published. You guys started trying to publish this what two years ago? Is it when you first submitted this paper? Andre, when did you first submit this paper? Oh. <laughs> yes, uh, like this about two years. Yeah, yeah two right. years. Yeah. Um, so. So it's, so it's been really painful, um, and hopefully uh, we're coming to the end of that pain soon with this new resubmission. Uh, who dropped? No, oh, Balash. Okay, hopefully we'll be back. All right, uh, next thing real quick. So um, so we were talking a lot about muscle cell data before, and I you know, was remiss in, in, in uh, working to get that. I have been in touch now with, uh, through, through the connection of Christian Grove, uh, been in touch with a, muscle cell, a C. elegans muscle cell physiologist, um, he offered to volunteer and help about a week ago. I sent him a list of re requests of what we would like to have in the form of a um, form of a presentation that I've linked here as the third link: muscle cell data figures. Um, I pulled these data figures from a recent uh, muscle cell physiology paper, um, and I sort of outlined them all, uh, sort of what the different traces are that they have there, and I've asked him to give us sort of high temporal resolution. Uh, versions of what we see in those figures. Um, and uh, right now, the challenge is that um, we, um, he, we haven't heard back from him, so at the moment we just have these figures. However, I think it's possible for us to make progress even just with these figures, um, because it's, I think it goes beyond the data, the very low resolution data set that we had originally from the Boyle et al. work. Um, so we could, we, so what, what I have in the very last slide of that uh, particular presentation is there is, there are some online tools for uh, pulling uh, curves out of uh, figures from, from papers. You can basically just sort of like line up and trace and then it'll output those XY. Um, you can even set what the axes are so you can actually read out the XY from it. I tried doing this. It's a bit time consuming. It's a little painful. Um, you do get data out. Now the challenge is the following. Uh, even with the best zoom in on the figure, um, the, re the time resolution of that is still going to be uh, lower than what it needs to be in terms of being able to accurately compute the, the first derivative of the slope of the action potential because the action potential is such a sharp, such a sharp uh, you know, event. So we may need to think about uh, subsampling those traces in some, in some way and possibly smoothing them. I don't know. It's 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 a bit of a hack. Obviously, it'd be much better to have, you know, data that comes directly from a you know from a physiologist rig, um, but we may have to make do with that right now. But anyway, it seems like if we can at least have those figures, um, you know, traced into some level of resolution, we'll ha we'd have a lot more than um, we did to begin with, uh, because it is looking at the muscle cell from many different perspectives. So um, I think we could meet on that and talk a little bit more about that in offline. But I just wanted to point. Uh, to that as some, as some progress there, because I know that we've been really <laughs> hungry for that kind of data. Okay. Any, any questions or issues on that? Um, 
Could I, could I ask for a bit of a clarification of what you mean when you po say about the resolution not being sufficient? I didn't quite understand what you mean exactly. Right. So um, the y you kind of need um, sampling at the level of sort of nanoseconds, I think, uh, in order to uh, properly capture the slope of the action potential as it goes up and comes back down again. Uh, it's important because if you're going to be training, you know, your genetic algorithm on the um, on the voltage versus the change in voltage uh, phase plot, uh, the curve will look quite different and look kind of messed up uh, if uh, if you don't have that level of time resolution. It would look very uh, very jagged and uh, won't really be enough to train up the level of dynamics uh, I think that you need. So. Yeah. Does that make I sense? I think that's not such a problem, actually, because all you have to do is just use linear interpolation. So an, any kind of sampling, you know, you're going to have 10 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz. You're never really going to have nanosecond resolution with any kind of experimental data that I can think of. So I don't, I don't, thi I don't think that is as big an issue. Is I think you, it might be quite easy to resolve that. Okay, good. I mean, we can check it out. All I'm saying is from personal experience of tracing the first figure, um, you know, you, you, there's, there's like not enough space as you trace up the, up the action potential. Um, there's not enough of a gap. It's like, uh, it's like on the same pixel uh, in, in, in height, which, so, you, so definitely interpolation is necessary, but it, I think it's, it's one step, it's a little bit more complicated even than just interpolation because your, your starting data is kind of not, um, doesn't have sufficient width. Okay. Anyway, well, it, it, it's a methodological. I, I, th I think we can, we can, uh, you know, we can fix it. I think we can get around it, but it's just, it's, it's a challenge right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so moving along, because I do want to get to the planning part. Um, so the neuroinformatics meeting, uh, we presented a poster last year about the Open Warm project. Uh, new abstracts are due this Friday. Uh, at the moment, they haven't been extended, so uh, right now Friday is the deadline. Um, hopefully, maybe there'll be an extension, but I don't think we can count on it. So, um, so I think we should discuss a little bit about what kind of thing we should submit. Um, I think that the work that we've done with the Neuromel Pactome so far uh, would be a really nice thing to feature. I think that uh, it's involved um, many of you in the project. I think that um, it's a nice story because it involves both the uh, you know, the virtual worm blender files and the conversion that was done there. It involves, you know, the work pulling it into NeuroConstruct and refining it. It involves the work that Tim's done uh, to, uh, you know, to add uh, some of the, uh, uh, you know, some of the connectivity data. Uh, Borg has also added some additional connectivity data. Um, and now that we're starting to work, you know, with some synapses um, and try to incorporate that, I think that uh, it's possible that we have even more by the time that we get to the end of uh, neuroinformatics. Obviously, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't report that yet. Um, but um, but we might have it, you know, and then be able to put a little bit more on the poster by the time that the meeting rolls around. So I'm thinking about writing up uh, an abstract just on that and just basically, you know, putting on uh, the folks that are here. That's sort of a starting thought. Um, however, there's a lot of other work and a lot of other activities that have happened, and I don't want to elevate that to, you know, the only thing that's happened. Obviously, there's a lot of, of other things that have happened. Um, the other thing is that I'm not, you know, we don't have to submit just one abstract. Uh, any of you who are planning or attending and, and wish to, you know, submit an abstract on some aspect of this, um, obviously free to. Um, so um, does anybody have any thoughts about, uh, about this and about the abstract and, and what they'd like to submit? Where is this going to be? It'll be in Munich. Hmm. Uh, I think it's a good idea um, to submit something on that, and um, I, I'm not going to go myself, but I know Robert is going to go, but um, he's not necessarily involved with this, um, but I'm happy to um, <coughs> have a look over if you did want to put an abstract together. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay, so we'll say it'll, we'll say it'll be that. Oh yeah, go ahead, Mateo. Okay. No, I was just thinking, would a poster along the same lines as we did last time, last year, would make sense? So planning the kind of progress throughout the different areas. 
first product was not like a, a talk that there, that you present some sign like true, but like the project is proceeding. We're still there. These are the new things that we did uh, in different areas with the. With the and some of the things that we've been presenting for the GPU stuff, reshaped, uh, of course, for the neuroinformatics target, maybe something like that will also make sense. Right, so that's another area. Um, so we could have two. We could have one that just focuses on the connectome and one that's just a general project update, or we could just have one that's just a general project update uh, that incorporates all the pieces and parts. Um, I guess I was thinking about focusing on that one piece, just a... Um, have a more you know focused presentation, but um, but we could do a more general one as well. Comments? Okay. Were you okay. planning on going, Stephen? What's that? Were you planning on going to Munich? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I will I will um, send around a document with the abstract um, sort of the, the abstract options and you guys can weigh in on it as you as you like um, so it sounds like those are the two choices is that we could either go focused or we could do general or we could do both um, if we do both we'll need um, we'll need two different people I think that actually I think maybe I can submit two that's right for informatics I can I can submit both um, so we'll just decide if we have um, Enough bandwidth to basically write up two and, a and then make two posters, which would be the, which would be then the downside is that we'll actually have to make two posters, um, but but I think that's that's fine and it might be good as well just to kind of incorporate some of these other pieces. Um, okay, great. So let's keep going. Um, so Kickstarter document. I don't want to say too much about this. You can click through to see the plans there for the the Kickstarter project that we're talking about. The main message here is that um, we're going to be having a meeting directly following this one which will start in an hour. Uh, we have a few other folks that are showing up uh, to that. Some of you who are here already are, um, are signed up to be in that. Um, if you are interested in being a part of that, this, that separate discussion, which is basically about putting together a pitch to, to raise funds from the general public, um, and you haven't been invited, please just, um, just let me know, chat me, or, or just say so right now, and I'll add you to that. Uh, obviously, it makes for kind of a long day of uh, spending time on Hangout. But um, but uh, you're more than welcome to join as well. So uh, so just let me know. Anybody anybody know right now that they would definitely want to want to join? I'll add you right now. Okay. Okay. Very good. And then uh, the last piece is sort of uh, agile process reboot. Um, actually, I think I'll skip that for n right now and just go right into the planning. But um, but I do want to talk about that as we get into process. Uh, down the road because uh, the way that we have organized ourselves uh, has changed from release one to release two and I think it could use some change again for release three just the way so that everybody knows kind of what's going on. Um, I, if, you, if you do want to just browse through it real quickly, I've linked to a document that kind of tries to capture the mix of both like agile and scrum-like development with uh, open source project development uh, for best practices. Uh, to some extent those are at odds with each other because Agile and Scrum development usually involves a team of fixed people, and open source usually involves people just coming in and, and contributing where they are passionate um, that and, and in a distributed way. So tr we've tried to seek the balance between these two, and, and this has changed from time to time, but um, I won't belabor that point right now. I just kind of want to jump into the, um, to the, uh, to the meat of it. So all right. Um, so let's go ahead and... Um, uh, as we get going, I guess, um, Mike, I know that at the at the end of uh, at, at the last presentation, um, you had had some some progress. Maybe I try to jot you off an email real quick here before this. But are, were you willing to talk a little bit about um, progress that you've made here, and, and maybe we can go through progress in general that folks have made, but just like five minute updates um, in the in the past couple weeks? Um, well, I've sort of made progress. So that's fine. Even so sort of, um, even a little progress is progress. <coughs> so, as um, as some of you probably know, what I'm what I'm currently working on is I'm developing a tool to perform um, optimize um, just run optimization routines on multi-compartmental models of neurons or cells in general to 
in order to constrain the parameters of the models towards their actual measured electrical behavior. Um, so what I've been doing for the last two weeks is getting um, the model which Alex has been, has been working on and trying to port it to work with my optimizer. Um, however, the reason I say I've sort of made progress is that at some point I kind of decided that it wasn't really going very well. I was finding it a little bit hard to work with the C code. So I've decided that what I'm going to do is try and write my own model um, in Neuron, just using Python and Neuron, because I'm much more familiar with that with that system, and um, try and optimize that. And that way we'll have two models running in parallel, and we can we can compare which we think is the best. But obviously, this might be a contentious issue, so I, wa I wanted to see what people thought about me developing my own muscle cell model in Neuron, rather than just having one one model. I don't know what, what do you guys think. Um, I, mean, I, I, I can comment. I mean, so just for historical purposes, this kind of thing has come up a lot um, in that uh, you know that we, we, we have a, a balance between um, integration integrated uh, work and uh, work that individuals have to do on their own, and uh, the general historical um, policy that we've had is is that you you know because it's an open source project, everybody kind of has to do what they are most comfortable with doing. So, um, so basically, if if it advances what you're doing um, to make it as a separate neuron model, and that you know, and that helps to keep gain insight, then go for it. Um, for us, I think ideally we would then want to you know uh, see if we can reintegrate what you've done in, in neuron back into NeuronML, um, and I think that it might even be more straightforward to do it then because like folks like Porg, for example, you know, has done a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, going back from neuron to, to into neuroml, um, so it might it might be easier. Um, you know, to some extent, it's a longer road, but to another extent, like you know, everybody has their own you know skill sets, and you know, I wouldn't want to have to code in C myself, uh, you know, but uh, but uh, other people are really really happy to code in C. So I think you just kind of got to do what you got to do. From from my perspective, at the end of the day, this is all um, this is all the basic research in a sense. What, what I'm trying to do is find a model which replicates the data which we have. Mm -hmm. Now, once, once I've found that, all that is essentially is just mathematics and you know, we, can, we can write any model we want. What I'm trying to do is parameter fitting. So I, I think at, the, at this stage it's still, I'm still doing some, some quite basic research into just trying to uh, trying to understand what kind of channel mechanisms I should be using. So I'm using this I'm using this uh, code which Alex has um, quite a bit to, to, to sort of get, get mechanisms and stuff. The problem is that my optimizer is really designed really designed to work well with Python and what I find myself doing is extending extending um, C into Python and it it's just a bit tricky to work with, so that's the only reason I'm doing that, really. Um, otherwise, um, some I'd like to make one general comment um, that on a, on the Open Worm website and it, it and, and and so on and so forth, in all a lot of our documentation, we refer to the optimization effort as uh, genetic algorithms. Mm. So I think. I don't think this is a particularly good idea because at the end of the day it's just optimization. Genetic algorithms are a very small are a very specific subset of optimization and if we, uh, for instance I've had a lot of success with things like swarm particle optimization, simu simulated annealing, um, I think it would make more sense to to call this component of the project the o optimization, model optimization rather than, than genetic algorithms. I don't know how, if, how anyone else feels about that. Yeah, it makes sense. Seems reasonable to me. Um. So, so I've got a, a model which I've which I've uh, made a, a single uh, single compartment model with some L-type calcium, some fast potassium, fast sodium. Um, it's being optimized right now to to the data which which you sent me and. Um, you know, depending on how, on how that goes, I, sh I should be able to push that push that model. Uh, Mike, soon. Mm -hmm. 
Um, is that the um, Boyle, Jordan Boyle's um, muscle cell model? So I'm uh, building my own model based on that, just because that Jordan Boyle model has things like its own solver and it's just... No. It's just Sorry, sorry. I mean, uh, the channels themselves, channel models, are those from the oil data? Oh no, no. But that's probably what I should be doing. No, I just, I just um, use some channel models which I'm familiar with. Got them off um, Model DB. But this is, I mean, this is pretty, pretty early, er, early stage stuff. I'm just want to prove in principle that I can, can get something similar to the data. And once, once I've done that, then, you know, more and more refinement. I can dis discuss it with, with, uh, with you guys. Um, Okay. Okay, that's great. I mean, um, if you did actually make something new on, if you wanted to do it on GitHub, then I could have a look at it as well. Um, I, my plan is to actually get the uh, Boil uh, channel models into channel ML. I haven't got around to it yet, but um, uh, if you did um, make any that were in, in implementing those channel models, that's great, um, and then I, that would help me from the point of view of getting them into channel ML. But if I get around to it first, then I mean, the channel ML can generate uh, mod files, so you could maybe reuse those. That would be fantastic. I mean, the um, the model I have right now is extremely it's extremely modularized, so replacing replacing channels would be a, v a very very trivial thing to do. So uh, I'm running optimization right now. Depending, you know, I should 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 be able to just publish that model, put that on, on online for everyone for you guys to scrutinize within the next few days. Uh, obviously, the, the main issue we have is, is just lack, lack of electro electrophysiological data. It's hard to optimize something when um, I, I think Alex, Alex also is running into this problem. If you, you lack data, it's, it's hard to know what you're optimizing toward. Right. So hopefully we can mine those figures, <laughs> get some of that. OK, great. Um, so that's excellent. Uh, let's, let's go around a little bit again. We're, we're shooting for you know, brief updates of, of, of progress. Um, obviously, this isn't quite as the formalized um, progress that we, normally, that we would normally have, because we do want to get to planning the, the release, and we have very little time. But, um, but I, I, Balash, you weren't here last time. I want to give you a chance to, to you know, say hi and, and tell us, let us know what you're thinking as well. And then maybe we'll go around for a few others. But let's, let's try to keep it quick. Okay, so just very briefly, so as I told you guys last time, uh, most likely I'm going to work in the summer with Neta Cohen down in Leeds. Um, for the summer project, basically I would just like to do something which uh, would familiarize me, familiarize me with uh, C. elegans research. So we came up with this uh, spin of the Eigenworm uh, paper that I'm sure that most of you have read. And basically we're just going to have some uh, C. elegans mutants and then do a, a very similar eigenworm analysis that is being described in that paper. And I'm sorry that I can't uh, quote you the author of the paper, but I'm pretty sure that most of you know the paper that I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so that, that's what's going on. They're still under uh, organization. It's, I would right now say it's 95% that it's going to happen, but there are some technical difficulties associated with this project. I don't want to go into the details. But yeah, that's what's going to happen. And other than that, I told uh, Stephen about this already. I'm planning to write a document which hopefully will be uh, serve as a starting point for the discussion for the long-term projects, uh, for the long-term goals of this project. So it will be something like the, the manifesto for the Open Room project. It, uh, I mean it just to be a, a conversation starter, but recently I've been thinking quite a lot about this uh, the Turing test for C. elegans, and, and, and the more I think about it, just more complicated it gets. So I'll just put this out document. Uh, right now I'm quite busy with the exams and things like that, so it won't be ready uh, anytime soon, but I would say within three weeks, four weeks, something like that, and then I'll, I'll publish it here, and then hopefully you guys going to have some great input to that one. Oh, did we lose him? Uh, yeah. Bandwidth yeah. limited. Are you back? Yeah. Okay. Well, what I heard was um, Balash, um, Turing test, Turing test or worm, uh, which is my favorite way to describe what it is that you're doing. Um, uh, so I'll put that there. So you are going to be you are going to be working with Neta then, in least. 
Well, as I told you already, there are some difficulties. Well, basically, my uh, fiance has to find something elite. She's going to have two interviews next week. The thing is, is that I would not like to do to spend only the summer with C. Elegance. I would like them to spend my PhD with C. Elegance, and for that, we, we would need to move to Leeds. Right now, things are looking good, but I will have much more information about this in two weeks' time. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the update. Um, Porg, I saw some uh, commits from you. Uh, did you want yes. to say real quick some stuff you've done? Um, yeah, uh, so recently we've been trying to get all of the um, connections out of that um, Excel spreadsheet into the NeuroConstruct project. We'd run into some difficulties there because um, some of the cells were connecting to themselves, uh, so gap junction connections to the same cell. Uh, we had a few mails on that and decided that uh, these actually do. They're quite strangely shaped. Um, and uh, just today I've been updating the NeuroConstruct project. So now if you, if you check it out, um, it will build. It will um, uh, it'll generate all 3,000 connections from the spreadsheet, including the cells connected to themselves. And it can be run in Neuron. So um, that's good progress from that point of view. Um, it's runs a little bit faster and when if you get the latest version of NeuroConstruct as well you can actually now view the individual cells. There had been a problem previously if you look at it you can generate the whole worm, look at the whole worm, but you couldn't actually look at the individual cells because they were generated away from the origin and so on. But now you can actually look and go in there and see the shapes of each of the cells, which is a little bit of progress. So uh, what I'm hoping to do is uh, well, make a few more commits and try to get the uh, connections as close as possible and then um, hopefully update the wiki page on NeuroConstruct because that is a little bit out of date and hopefully then make it easier for people to download NeuroConstruct and look at the CL Games project. Terrific. So one of the things that uh, NeuroML has the ability to do is to define the positions of synapses along multi-compartmental models. Um, but up until now, we haven't really had that data because um, it doesn't exist in the original white uh, Connectome, they just went through and they found it themselves. So this is where Steve Cook here um, has volunteered to help out, which is really awesome because his whole project and the software that he's written um, is, and, uh, and, and some of the additional software that we're looking to use is all about you know, going back through those EMs and new EMs that, are, that they're producing and, um, and locating those synapses. Um, so if we can then translate that into the existing set of connections that we have and put all that into, into NeuroML, we're going to have something I think that's pretty pretty profound um, in that, you know, I think it is clear that uh, with, the, with the propagation time um, along the axons of C. elegant cells that uh, the propagation time may actually have an impact on the dynamics uh, and the function of, of the worm, that knowing the position of the, those synapses will actually tell you something about you know, in what order a certain uh, cell would talk to some uh, would talk to some other cells. So, um, so Steve, do you want to say a little bit about what we're uh, what we're sort of hatching here, um, and also uh, if you can tell them a little bit about CatMade and the ideas that uh, that we have there? Yeah. So I looked at the list of muscle cell it was MDL eight, which was interested in which cells are talking to MDL eight. I have data for some of these, but a lot of these neurons are born in the ventral cord and commissures to the dorsal cord. So for my reconstruction of the data that everyone's familiar with, with from Chiklovsky and Beth Chen, which is what's considered the standard, I guess, right now for the data, um, I've, I've partially reconstructed that. So the nerve ring is completely reconstructed, proofread. The ventral ganglion has been reconstructed. I am currently reconstructing the RVG, which is the retrovesicular ganglion. Um, dorsal cord is to come next. Dorsal cord is relatively simple part of the nervous system. Very few processes, not many synapses. But um, in terms of completeness of our data set with our reconstruction project, it's we have around maybe 6,300 synapses right now. I forget what the Chiklowski data set is, but we do find different connections. We find different weights of connections. But So I'm working on the ventral cord now, trying to trace that back to get the majority of the cell bodies in the retrovesicular ganglion. Then go move to the dorsal cord, try to get some of these connections to MDL8. Um, 
where Cat Maid comes in is possibly if anyone here or elsewhere is interested in jumping in with the reconstruction, dorsal cord might be a good place to start if we could get people to mark these data while I'm marking different data or just as sake of comparison could provide a platform to do this pretty simply. I have all the images in hand, they just need to be um, aligned and then put into format to work with CatMade. So. So CatMade is a is a is a tool that's built by um, well se several folks. Um, I know that one of the folks uh, that I, I that I know quite well who's worked on the project and, and a web-based version of it is is a gentleman named Stephen Gerhard. Uh, some of you know who he is and met him before. He's he's a very talented uh, guy in this in this area. And uh, the whole point of of it is to be able to mark up synapses collaboratively on the web um, and to do to do EM segmentation on the web. But but synapses is kind of the main use case. So um, the problem, you know, it's, it's challenging to mark this stuff up and, and Steve, you know, spends time, you know, going through synapse by synapse and marking these guys. Um, so because it's, it's such a time consuming task, we sort of thought about this before here in the project, but it seems like CatMate would be a great platform for us to load up these data sets and then, um, you know, write up some instructions and to see if we can get folks on the web to you know, help us out um, so that we can then not just have the connections but have the actual positions of them. And then the idea of MDL08 as we've, as we've done is to kind of see if we can do that in a way radiating out from MDL08. We know what the motor neurons are that are connected but we don't know where the positions are connected so that we would um, be able to continually flesh out the model um, in terms of where the positions of the synapses are radiating outward from, from MDL08 to those motor neurons and then maybe the inner neurons that are connected. But um, so Steve has, um, has a database structure where he has the records of all the positions of synapses and um, I asked Sergey if he would be willing to have a look at, at that and see if we can you know, uh, write up some Python script to incorporate that in the NeuroML. Um, he said he can. Uh, Porg, if, if, there's a, if, if you want to hook in on this as well, um, that would be very useful. Otherwise, we can, I think we can just figure out how to you know, go from the MySQL data schema into into some existing NeuroML. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm really glad that Steve has uh, volunteered to help with this because um, I think we have the chance to produce um, probably the most complete, uh, you know, NeuroML, well, and certainly the only NeuroML uh, reconstruction of, of C. elegans, but one of the more complete um, uh, structural models of C. elegans neurons um, from data that are out there uh, that's ever been created. So I, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, so let's see, time is ticking. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, real briefly, uh, Giovanni Matteo, you guys were at uh, GPU um, meeting for neuronal simulation in Munich uh, this week. You guys, uh, you know, sent a report uh, you know, on, on the team box. Do you guys just want to summarize, you know, for you know five minutes uh, how that went and uh, things that we we take, can take away from that? I can go through those points if you want. Yep. Uh, okay, so it was good. People seem to receive the presentation well, so uh, they found it interesting. At least that's what they said. Uh, and there was a lot of feedback after the presentation. So for, for who's not aware, the presentation was about uh, the Hodgkin actually neuronal solver that we wrote uh, that runs on GPUs. Um, so the focus of the talk was basically what kind of architecture we used and GPUs and stuff, but obviously there were details in terms of um, the biology and what kind of neural models we are using and so forth. So m most of the feedback was uh, not on the software side of it, but obviously on the modeling side of it. And uh, I, I posted this something in Teambox and I just briefly summarize that. So basically one one of the one of the most common kind of feed, feedbacks we got was uh, when, when, when we were talking about using Hodgkin Oxley to simulate both muscle cells and uh, motor neurons, the, the feedback was why don't you try and use uh, simpler models so that you have uh, less para parameters to figure out. So, and this was, was Eugene Izekiewicz who brought that up. And I guess you know that guy is. Uh, so, 
And if not, this guy was known in neuroscience and he wrote books. He's got a mod neuronal model named after him. So w when he proposed uh, a simpler model, I'm kind of guessing <laughs> he was proposing this model. Uh, <laughs> so basically, I don't know, this, this is like for us to discuss. The reason why we picked Dutch can ask is because the motor neurons, even though they don't spike, obviously they still can be described uh, uh, as such can actually neurons because you describe them in, in terms of the ion channels. And uh, so we could use the same solver for both the motor neurons and the muscle cells, just with different ion channels. So that's why we picked that in the first place. Um, and the suggestion was in terms of the amount of data we don't have. So he said since you, you have a lot of neurons, so 300 is not a lot, but still if you have to go there and figure out everything for each of them, it's going to take you a long time. So why don't you try to pick a model that has less uh, kind of unknowns? So that, that, that's one, one, one comment. Do um, you, you want me to go through all of them or, or do we just discuss this one now? Uh, well, I, I just think um, we probably should, should chat about that as it relates to kind of what we're going to do in the next uh, six months. Yeah, um, so has anyone any thoughts on that? Do, do, I, first of all, I am not aware of any uh, non-spiking neural model that we could use simpler than Hodgkin actually. Do you know well, any of them? <coughs> I mean, the um, Isakiewicz model also has uh, sub-threshold behavior. I mean, you can, I mean, if it's not isolating, it, it can, it, it obviously can spike, but um, you can actually get some interesting sub-threshold behavior. I mean, it will integrate inputs, and it will behave like a cell, which is integrating inputs. But as I say, I mean, if it doesn't spike, well, it depends exactly what you mean by spiking. I mean, if this is a thing that I'm still a bit curious about. If none of the cells are spiking, then <laughs> how do the synapses actually fire? Yeah, we don't. I guess we don't know that. <laughs> I mean, is it crossing a certain threshold that's much lower than a normal spike? I don't know. Well, I, I think in order to have a synapse fire, right, you just have to raise the membrane potential high enough. Right, this the snare proteins are gonna are voltage se are voltage sensors, and they're gonna do their thing for ves vesicular release um, above whatever threshold it is that they you know that that, that, that they have, right? Um, so the main so difference is it doesn't actually um, uh, reset at that point. It um, may just spike, and then if it goes down again, goes back up again, it may uh, synapses uh, the vesicles may be re released again. I think so. Steve is nodding his head. Steve, do you have more uh, insight on this? Um, from what I understand, the best way to think of it is more of a threshold way, like you said, Stephen. I know with a certain unit in the male in a calcium channel, which is a rectifying calcium channel, if you have that mutant worm, the worm will continuously prod its spicules, or at least the male worm will, and there's a strong feed-forward architecture in the male copulatory circuit suggesting that you kind of raise this base threshold you get increased activity in downstream neurons. So from that bit of connectivity data and observance of immune behavior, I mean, that's probably the best guess that we have right now. OK. Um, yeah, so I mean, but I, I still think maybe, OK, that uh, Isikiewicz may be useful from that point of view. OK, it, it might not necessarily have traditional spikes, but um, you can still well, you should be able to put on a synapse model onto that cell, which will listen for crossing a certain threshold and send a, a, a synaptic event when it crosses that threshold. So we're you saying that that's probably, it's probably a good idea to look into that as a way to reduce the, uh, <coughs> to reduce the search space for the parameters? Maybe, yes. Um, but I mean, hopefully your sol solver will be generic enough. I mean, if it can solve um, Hodgkin Huxley, then uh, Isikiewicz is a lot easier than that. So um, yeah, yes. we will have to write another solver, basically. Um, I don't know that you can. You, so you, you're solving ODEs inside the Huxley. I guess the logic 
for the easy savage model would have to be recorded. It's it's gonna be probably easier than than the ODEs, okay, but, but still we we need to put it together. But I'd Actually, they're still ODEs. They're just simpler ODEs. Yeah, yeah. It's just simple. But I mean, still, you have to write it again. Yeah. Well, I might simplify. I guess. Well. Yeah. Uh, I mean. I mean, ideally, you're. Sorry. Yeah. Like? Yeah. It depends how how modularized your solver is. There should be a lot of reusable elements. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, not modular at all, other than um, the code that's inside doesn't know about the outside. So at the moment, we don't have a ODE component that you change that and it's fine. So at the moment, it's just uh, it's contained into a solver, but it's not very modular the way that it is at the moment. So uh, that, that's not an issue. I mean, the, uh, rewriting the solver is it's the la last of our pro last least of our problems, I think. Uh, so I, I think what we need to figure out is, uh, is it worth investigating this alternative to Hodgkin Axley and how do we know that it's good enough and uh, worth pr pursuing? So that, that's the question basically. Um, it, it sounded like it might be a good option. Sorry, Mike, go on. I'm, I'm still trying to understand what what the strong motivation for that would be, what the, what the part why there would be a particularly large, you know, big advantage to doing that? Less, less parameters, as I understand it, as, in, as I am understanding it. Yeah, but y you want to, you want your model to be as simple as possible, but no simpler, right? And if you yes. know, you might find yourself. There's no way of knowing whether we'll find ourselves in a situation where, yes, we have less parameters, but because we have less parameters, we can't reproduce. Yeah, exactly. This is, one of, this is just a fundamental question in modeling. How, how 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 much can I simplify? It's impossible to know. Yeah. I would say we've gone down a Hodgkin Huxley route at the moment. There's no obvious reason why that's uh, why there why we should change. Yeah, I mean it might be useful. It could be useful from the point of view of um, just uh, um, faster simulations. I mean, if you just have one set of ODEs to solve as opposed to uh, ODEs for each um, channel, then it could be up to four times faster. But um, I think for the time being, that's probably not the key issue. Um, solving for a certain set of parameters, uh, when it's a hodgkin actually based cell, you might need to solve for six different parameters, um, as opposed to easy cabbage where it might be two to four. As, as long as you can get it to spike, get it to behave reasonably well, then you could solve for either of these models. One advantage of working with a Hodgkin-Huxley model is we could, in the future, find ourselves in a situation where we could say, ah, right, we want to simplify our model for speed. Um, so let's get our Hodgkin, this, this Hodgkin-Huxley Hodgkin -Huxley component and build an Zikovic model yeah. from that. Going the other way might be harder. You know, go, saying, oh, you know, our simulation isn't working, it's not producing the desired effects, perhaps it's because one of our models isn't uh, doesn't have the necessary complexity, so let's add. Com My feeling is that would probably be trickier. If we were if we were in a situation where 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 you know computational efficiency is a real major 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 concern, and we're talking about the difference between a year simulation or a day simulation, then yeah, but it doesn't seem to me that there's a particularly strong motivation or that that might change. No, I agree with you. I don't see a particularly strong reason to, to change that unless um, the, the, the lack of uh, data uh, it would be the only reason, I think. Uh, okay, so when, Porg, when you were suggesting at the last time when we started uh, talking about release three and, and the work that we're going to do in the next uh, six months, you suggested scaling down to a 100 cell version model, um, 100 cell version of the model, and I have noted here sort of maybe reviving the, the cyber elegance code, and um, and there's been some discussion about, uh, you know, uh, about this, and also in terms of just um, the... Um, the attention that the Worm Browser brought and having something that people can actually play with and, and having kind of the immediacy of it. So um, 
I just, just as a, a potential focus for the next six months, it seems like there's something in the air that we're, we're kind of dancing around this idea of having something simplified as compared to the, the big thing, but I don't think we've quite settled on what that should be. Um, and also, I think Valash, if, you know, when it comes to behavior and, and things that you're looking at uh, at doing, again, the, the cyber elegance model where you can actually, you know, see the, you know, the movement of the body of the, of, of the animal, and it does have, you know, physics reintegrated into it, again, is something where, you know, we might want to, we want, might want to move it forward. This last weekend, you know, rereading and, and helping to edit the cyber elegance paper, it also, you know, emphasizes uh, the, the integration um, work that has been done there, and um, although it, it has, uh, you know, it's not a complete uh, connectome, for example, it doesn't have the, the nerve ring completely implemented in it, um, so it doesn't have all the neurons uh, to begin with. It is, it is a piece, and I think that uh, Andre and Sergey and, and, and Alex have wanted it to be a base to build on. So um, I just kind of want to pick that up again. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that I think if we can publish anything, that would be awesome, because at the end of the day, we, we need more people, more, and especially more people from the biology side who can give the data to the modeling people here. And if we are able to publish papers, that, will be, uh, that way we'll be able to get more resources, just basically more researchers, more people would be willing to contribute uh, their data to our model. Uh, so I think uh, no matter how simplified their model is, and it doesn't matter that cyber elegance doesn't have all the details and not the proper connectome, if we can publish two, three papers in the next, I don't know, year or two, I think that would be awesome. Well, this one is uh, hopefully sub resubmitted for the last time uh, to in the Journal of In Silico Biology. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, so that's one. Um, but, but, this, but setting the, the question of publication aside, you know, for the next six months, I mean, on the development effort, you know, opening up that code base and doing something with that code base is, you know, something that will require some deliberate, uh, some deliberate effort. And uh, so I think we need to figure out if that's something that we want to do, and if so, you know, who's going to do it, and, and how does this other work that we've been doing to kind of be more uh, biophysically realistic with uh, the physics-based algorithm, how, how does that connect with the current work, and, and just how do we, how do we organize ourselves? Maybe, uh, Andre, if you have a viewpoint here on this guy, obviously since Cyber Elegance is the work that you spearheaded, I mean, do you have a perspective here on, on you know, the time that it's taken so far to get as far as we have, and, and do you think that we should go back to that code base, and if so, you know, how should we, how should we connect it with, with our current efforts? Here we have two uh, opposite uh, points. Uh, first, uh, one of them, we lose time. I spend it to um, continue support uh, cyber elegance. But at the same time, uh, this is something uh, which already works, and uh, we can get um, something um, working better uh, and uh, more quickly than uh, the perfect uh, ideal uh, code which we expect from uh, open worm. Uh, it's quite complex problem. It's hard to estimate all the aspects. Mm. Do you personally have a have a preference? What you would like to see? I would prefer to um, pay all attention uh, um, to um, open worm uh, new realization where everything will be um, close to perfect <laughs> from the very beginning. Yeah. So you do you do look ahead to the next version. Yeah. Go 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 ahead, Mateo. Uh, basically, I like very much the idea of having, uh, uh, as I was saying last time, the idea of having a simpler worm, okay, that we can use to showcase. I'm not sure that uh, reworking on the cyber elegance code base would be the solution. I would be personally more inclined towards leveraging on this mission engine that we've been building so far and uh, the building uh, of which will basically not sidetrack us because we'll still 
building components that will be needed uh, for the as perfect worm, I think it would be make more sense. Yeah, so it it's like. Yeah. Sorry. If you develop uh, a simpler worm on the simulation engine architecture, all of that work we would be able to reuse on the accurately, uh, biologically accurate simulation. So it's not work that you are throwing away. So just using yeah. the simpler worm, uh, this head kind of uh, test out all the technology side, and we also have something to show far quicker than we would if we wait for the um, biologically accurate simulation that can still go on in parallel. So it doesn't mean that uh, we stop on that. So people who are working on, uh, I don't know, Andre, for example, is working on the SPH, they can keep working on that. Maybe someone is working on porting, porting, uh, quote, uh, porting something like the cyber elegance and making it work on, on the simulation engine. Yes. Uh, so that, <coughs> yeah. So Patrick, sorry. No, I mean, um, that's completely what I, what I uh, was suggesting, that um, you have basically a test bed, a kind of skeleton, simplified, abstract uh, worm where it might have 100 cells. You know, ultimately, it's going to have uh, motor neurons. You know it's going to have muscle cells. Just put those in and try to make the very simplest locomotion system you can possibly make. And then uh, if, if it's in NeuroML, if it's in NeuroConstruct, then you can uh, simulate on neurons, simulate it on... Um, uh, the simulation engine and I mean all of that work will be reused for the more complex model and then I mean if it is just a, a long stick and it moves and you can put in some uh, ion channels you can put in some currents down it and get it to wiggle um, get it to move to a, a physical substance then I mean it's a start and it'll be easier to test out ideas on that than it will be to try to fit it into the overall complete model. I agree I think it makes a lot of sense as an approach. Well, Balash, from uh, the perspective of somebody trying to test this stuff out, uh, do you want to weigh in here? I agree 100%. I think, especially because right now we know that our uh, the open worm is going to lack a, a lot of biological detail. There is no shame in building a simplified model of the worm. And yeah, if you can just get something out uh, that wiggles and just looks slightly C elegance-ish, I think that would be well worth the effort. I don't know the software engineering part of it, but if the code would be reusable, I guess then it would make it a, a, a double win situation. But I perfectly agree with the uh, with trying to come up with, come out with something that is uh, uh, simplified than the open worm and uh, make it publicly available so everybody can uh, play around with this model. I think that would be also a good recruiting tool for us. Yeah. The good thing mm -hmm. is that uh, it is. the test is already there because cyber elegance works, as Andre said. So we know, so it's not like we don't know how to do this. We, we just okay. have to look at how that's done and re replicate it into the simulation engine so that we can make it available to the, to the general public in a, in a way that it's uh, probably easier than getting the executable down and running it. So, and by doing that, we basically build all the technical infrastructure we need in order to run the accurate simulation in the future. And so that, that's my, my take, and I, and I think it makes a lot of sense. And just to reply to Andre, uh, obviously, we all prefer to look to the future, and, and by doing this, people wouldn't have to stop. So, so who's working on the connectome keep, keep work, keeps working on the connectome. Who's working on the SPH or whatever keeps working on that. Uh, some people will, will take time to, to kind of uh, do this part of the project, but the rest of the project will be basically virtually unaffected by that. And, And, and I would and I would recommend if you guys are on Windows systems that you do uh, that you do follow that link from the um, from the Google Docs and uh, that I that I send out there on the agenda that's linked to the download for the Cyber Elegance play with it um, because it is really nice and it does it does meet at least the minimum requirement that uh, that Balash was saying of uh, 
it starts and it wiggles and it has um, it has some uh, uh, some instructions for how it works. So it's quite nice, actually. Um, I think that we should uh, that we should feature it. So I guess the questions are, are like, what sort of steps do you guys envision for this simpler model um, in terms of the pieces that we've built already? Um, if we were going to plan this out, what would it kind of look like? Step one, step two, step three, to get to the kind of model that you guys are thinking mm. about. If, if we do it leveraging the current work that we've been doing on the simulation engine, it won't be much different think, from what we had already on our roadmap. Uh, trying to be a bit concrete. Basically, if we go with Cyber Elegance, okay, Cyber Elegance has a front end uh, uh, built in open um, rendering engine that already works. So you go with Cyber Elegance, uh, you can leverage that. All right, and you can basically leverage all the code, but all the efforts that you're putting there, it's thrown away. If we go with the simulation engine, we were uh, basically doing the perfect worm. Still, one of the steps that we were going to take was to build a front end uh, potentially based on WebGL, uh, and uh, you, you would have to. It wouldn't be any effort that we are kind of wasting. It wouldn't. It won't be thrown away because it would be exactly the same front end for the perfect world. So in terms of the roadmap, we need to put in place all the m minimal components that are required in order to have the cyber elegance in the simulation engine. So what it is that we have in the in the cyber elegance that we don't have in the simulation engine. We don't have a front end based in WebGL. We don't have a streaming. Uh, a it will be required basically to transfer data from the solvers to the front end, and this is something that uh, we were discussing with uh, Sergey like a month ago, and doing, and things as is always got in the way, but basically that will be one thing to do, and uh, I, I I want to leverage a software engineering view in the sense that ideally the difference in these uh, simplified worm and the perfect worm will be just the different data that you will be feeding into the same kind of machine. So in one case, at some stage in the future, we'll have all the data that are required with all the details, cells, to simulate the open world. But having this engine, it would mean that for the simplified version, we'll be just feeding different data, but otherwise we need to the engine that can bring us there. So beside the front end and the streaming stuff, uh, we need to basically finish, uh, reshape the neural solver in a way that it can be maybe, and that is us, maybe a generic solver that can take an arbitrarily neuromel file, in, in which case there might be code generation involved there. The other thing that we need to do is uh, to basically complete the solver so that it can take some data. And again, those data don't have, won't have to be as accurate as in the perfect form, but it can be already an initial stage. And we need to put all of those pieces together. So from that point of view, what we need to do is in no way different for some of us, at the very least from what we were going to do with the perfect worm. So I don't see a change of direction as such. It's more a kind of uh, marketing uh, in terms of uh, along uh, with the simulation engine, we let's build a simplified version in parallel of the data that we'll be simulating. And this will be showcased and we'll basically use it to show the project around and get the people's attention. OK. And I think in terms of uh, solvers, so you, you don't necessarily have to be one sol to have one solver that runs everything. It could be just another solver, which you could call whatever, simple, so simple neuron solver. And it's just an integrate and, and fire solver. Or it's just a logic threshold unit solver. So you could just instantiate. If it's a simple model, you just use the simple neuronal solvers, if it's the biologically accurate one, you swap in the Atkinac split. So I, I don't, I mean, I, in terms of uh, the way we are going about things, it will be the exact same uh, strategy.
as Matteo was saying, but it's just just that it takes you less time to get to something that works. So do I hear it sounds like in the next six months we definitely want to have a front end where we can see the results of the simulation, although albeit a, a simplified version of it, but basically a, a moving worm. And do we want to say in WebGL, or do we want to well, do we want to specify that right now? That would be ideal. ideal. Um, yeah, I don't know that we can do it in six months. I certainly hope if we can do that, that would be a great result. I think. Can I add? Uh, and that. Mm, sorry. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm 100% uh, agree about um, the possibility to use a simplified version of uh, near and also solar. And uh, I offer uh, to have the same for uh, physical engine uh, because uh, I'm afraid I feel that uh, SPH can becomes um, a weak place which takes quite a lot of time to develop. Uh, and um, we already need to start uh, using it. So possibly we should think about possibility mm, <laughs> to mm, have uh, possibly something uh, simple uh, as a physical engine in cyber elegance, uh, which um, can be used uh, possibly um, with some uh, adapter. Um, between, uh, well, possibly we can, for example, uh, generate uh, all the positions of the particles which will be in uh, real speech. So we can um, uh, get the approximate uh, positions from simplified uh, physics solver, um, and. Uh, so we can project uh, all other um, stuff um, on this um, physical uh, model and uh, possibly it can run slight, uh, a bit different, but um, visually looking uh, almost the same um, at this simplified uh, physics. And when SPH will be ready, of course, we will switch to it. The possibility to choose to do that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, my uh, my question here would be: When we're talking about simplified, a simplified model, we should probably define exactly what we mean by simplified. So we're talking a you know, about simplifying the physics solver, perhaps simplifying the neuronal solver, simplifying the morphology. Um, we should we should really write down what about this model is simplified and really figure it out. For instance, and because I think s um, it's easier to make the case for some simplifications than others, possibly. For instance, simplified morphology. Um, if we have a w well-defined morphology, then and we're talking about going from a thousand cells to a hundred cells, for instance, you know, not a, not a particularly huge difference. I, I'm not sure that makes as much sense as a sim simplified fluid dynamic solver. I don't know. Um, I think uh, the details of that are in Andre's paper, right? Of what, what is simplified? The simplified details, like how the cyber elegance was implemented, it's all in the oh. paper. Well, what, what cyber elegance left out, right. So, you, so for example, they left, out, they left out neurons of the nerve ring um, in favor of neurons of the, you know, the, the, the ventral cord that inter innervate the muscles. Um, if I have that accurate, and um, and so that means there's no sensory neurons as well. Um, so they are basically driving the muscles in, into the body frame uh, and making that part work. Um, so that's one thing. But um, but the engine, the physics engine itself, is not uh, is not simplified. And there are there is like frictional forces that are in there. So that part is is the same. So is that the kind of simplification that we want? Just sort of fewer Fewer neurons, or I would base it on that. But physics is also simplified in the sense that uh, uh, with the perfect worm, we were going to simulate the fluid dynamics of it, while it's hard mechanics in the cyber. Level. Well, so that's the question: Do we want to do we want to only have hard mechanics, or do we? Because it sounds like what Andre was saying is that he's 
he's volunteering to integrate the you know SPH into the Cyber Elegance code now. But so that's so that's a question. So what do we want to what do we want to do? Uh, I actually don't know. Uh, what I got from Andre is that he was saying that it might take a long time to write uh, the SPH solver. And uh, it might make sense uh, to write uh, a simplified uh, cyber elegance like uh, a physical solver for this in the simulation engine framework to si to basically run the simulation of this simplified world. But I'm not sure if I got it uh, right. I think I got the, the same. And then when this the HPH is ready, we swap it in. That's that's what I that's what I think. Yeah. I, I, if we want, and if we want it to be as easy as swapping it in, we'll need to mm, plan it, uh, and because be you need to have the same input, uh, you know, if you want to get the same uh, interface. But that sounds like a good idea. It probably won't be that easy, both for the neuronal simulation and for the physics. But uh, it's not like we're writing it from scratch anyway. We know we're gonna have to do it. So it's not like we're going to be surprised when we have to change some stuff. But yes, if we plan it in advance, we, we might have to change. We might make it so that uh, we don't have to change too much stuff. But so something's going to have to be changed, I guess. Um, OK, so if we have fewer neurons, then do we need to simplify Hodgkin-Huxley for some, some other kind of model? Or do we stick with Hodgkin-Huxley but just have fewer, fewer, fewer motor neurons? What happened in uh, Cyber Elegance was yeah, so they were simplified neurons. Yes, I would use those. I would just <coughs> use that as a spec. They were like yeah, a I mean, fire. maybe a short-term um, uh, plan is to actually try to get as much of Cyber Elegance into NeuroML as possible, get it into NeuroConstruct, and then at least there's a description of what that model is supposed to do. Um, the majority of what it is supposed to do is should be supported under the um, simulation engine and should be runnable under whatever um, uses NeuroML. Uh, if that can be put in there, uh, then at least this, um, with the second generation of various tools being developed for this, it can be supported. It can run, and if it wiggles, that's great. If it moves within um, a soft uh, body, then that's even better. But I mean, it, it's a starting point that'll. Uh, produce results a lot quicker than the full version. Mm. And everything there can be reused for the full version, I think. I would... Uh, I think... Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jayvon. I know, just one sentence. I would use uh, Cyber Elegance paper as, as, as a spec. So I would do that, replicate that into the simulation engine so that we can make it available to the public and use it as a way to build the infrastructure that then we will reuse for the accurate simulation. Yeah, this will involve a lot of planning, as, as, as you said, because we want to make it modularized enough that yeah. you know, when right. we develop a new... View, it's a kind of modular already. So what's in the solver is not modular. So in the solver, you can put as much garbage as you want, as long as the solver is independent from the rest of the architecture. That's my view. So even if we hack together something inside the solver, as long as it doesn't affect what's outside, I'm happy enough. Obviously, this is just a kind of a exaggeration, but <laughs> yeah. But I do think it's important as well that we keep that we keep some of the activities going on the more detailed stuff and the data collection, obviously. Uh, moving forward, so I think that uh, you know gathering these details, and I, and I think you guys aren't going to disagree with that. I'm just just thinking from a planning perspective and, and speaking to Mike to Mike directly. I mean, I think that the work that you're doing for the optimization is critical, and I think that um, we want to aim that if, as much as we can on you know more detailed versions. I think this is where continuing to the focus on the on the muscle cell and building up from that in parallel with the simplified effort, uh, the simplified you know large scale or you know, complete model, end-to-end uh, -end model is uh, is important. So, but I think that uh, those individuals um, can sort of sort themselves into these two camps of, of that larger goal versus kind of the more detailed building out iterative goal. I don't know. Does that seem reasonable? Certainly, it does. Steven? The point of it all is that you don't shut down the rest. Right. And our friends are not shut up. So nothing shuts down. We keep doing what we are doing. Uh, some people will be working on this simpler 
uh, on a volunteer basis, we'll be working on the simpler simulations. And, and I'll shut up now. Uh, go ahead, Mateo. Uh, no, I want to make maybe a suggestion. I don't know, you guys should tell me if it's a good idea. Because, uh, like, right now in these um, bi weekly meetings, we start to have more and more people. And uh, actually, uh, there will be even more left out, maybe. And there are so many things to, that are increasingly, increasingly difficult to talk in details about some things. And uh, if uh, we could split the, if we could create sub areas of the pro project, and then having, in the same way that we have this more general biweekly meeting. Uh, I, I don't know if weekly or biweekly meeting for each one of the areas, and that at the end of that, uh, whoever is overseeing those areas will uh, report and speak for the more general meeting. Maybe we can put together a structure that it uh, it will help us focusing. For instance, I was just thinking about it right now. It looks to me like we have one area which is physical solver, which can overlook at both the SPH and the potentially simplified uh, uh, physical solver. Another area would be neuronal solver, okay? Then there would be this uh, front end, which is visualization. There is one area which is integration of all of these things together. And then there is another area which is uh, still work on collecting and optimize data uh, for a perfect worm, all right? So I, I don't know if these areas are enough, but the main idea is that uh, we create such areas and that we basically uh, have only a subgroup of people for, for each one of so that we start being a bit more organized in that way. Otherwise, I feel that uh, like there might be people that uh, don't get as much the possibility to contribute as they might. I don't know, four of us talking about the specific topic. So it's a, and this doesn't fall in the what are we going to do next, but more in the how are we going to do it for the next release. So that is my suggestion. Because I personally uh, see a bit of too many things going on at the same time and a bit of difficulty to, and actually there are things that I cannot contribute on, so, but, and I, w I would be interested in it, but not in all details, uh, and I could spend personally my time focusing more on the things that I can actually contribute on. So that's why I was thinking at uh, this sort of pyramid uh, where uh, basically there's a bit more of structure. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. And I think that uh, the only thing that limits that, obviously, is the bandwidth of each of us individually, uh, you know, as this is an open source and volunteer project. But I think that uh, it's completely reasonable for us to subdivide. Um, I think right now we're having this meeting with everyone just because we do, we are at this period now where we're thinking of, you know, broad strokes about, you know, what we want to get done in the next six months. And I want very much that not to be driven by you know, me, <laughs> I think I think that needs to be driven by what everyone here sees that they want to get out of this. And some of us are interested in data integration, some of us are interested in, in model optimization, some of us are interested in uh, having uh, rational ways to test, uh, you know, biology, some of us are interested in software engineering. So I just want that all to be driven by us. But I, I think you're absolutely right. I think in the future we, we're going to see a lot more of these sort of sub subgroups and subcommittees meeting to, to actually discuss you know, paths forward, and I think since we only have five minutes left here, we're going to have to defer that, uh, you know, the, the rest of the planning out to those sort of subgroups that we make, that we make up. So does anybody, I don't know, should, how should we organize that? Does anyone want to step up to volunteer for a particular subcommittee and... Can I recommend four divisions? And I'm sure, like, people disagree with me, but I thought it seems to me that we could probably divide ourselves into... Um, Visualization, um, electrophysiology, which includes optimization and neuronal solver, um, physical solver, and integration. Uh, okay, physical digits. solver and integration. Electrophysiolo electrophysiology, which includes which includes uh, optimization, model building, data, electrophysiological data, visualization, third one, and integration of everything as a fourth subdivision. Like you mentioned physical solver, you didn't mention neuron. I did. 
Oh, neuronal solver, I would, I would consider to be part of the electrophysiological. That might be quite a big one, I don't know. But that's, I mean, that's what yeah, it is. Because, because, because see, it, it, I, I wouldn't mix up the more uh, data gathering and computation with a, a more computational side of it, even if, of course, they are something common, but all of these areas at some extent have something in common, but as a group, I think it, there might be different groups. <coughs> I was thinking five areas earlier, and so those two you would split electrophysiology. I I, I I I I would just because it's even if they have stuff in common, it's kind of different different people the way I see it. So how how do you split electrophysiology? Optimization and neuronal solver, I think, which are those those the two things that Mike mentioned. Is it? Okay, but where does the data? Where, then where does the data collection come in here? I yeah. am writing down, Stephen. So that. Okay. So these are the five areas that I'm thinking. The same, right? Except that. I mean, they can be broad. Each huh? of these areas. Sorry, I mean, integration would that include data, getting the yeah. data, um, translating it into something that everybody else can look at, and. Um, Putting it on the web. I mean, maybe integration uh, and promotion of project might be bundled together. Well, for integration, I was thinking uh, about it from a very. Uh, maybe there are areas missing. Uh, for for integration, I was thinking more from a technical point of view that uh, we'll have a neural solver, we'll have some data, that will have a physical solver, we'll have visualization, <coughs> make all of, orchestrate the whole thing together. So and marketing, uh, as you're saying, uh, is also another area, and uh, so it might be we might end up with six. Yeah, areas. promotion. Mm. So optimization, I would say that would that should be model building, data, and optimization, because optimization relies on the model building and the data and acquiring data and understanding the data. So I would say optimization is actually. Almost a minor is almost the least important component of those three, rather than the yeah. most important one. The challenge here is that I think there's some activities that will cross-cut individuals. Uh, mm. I think that some individuals need to be part of, of several different uh, areas. Which is uh, fine, I guess. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. it's fine as long as it's not twelve people in every one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we've run out of time, and uh, we're going to hop on to the other uh, Kickstarter meeting uh, now. And uh, there's some other individuals who aren't part of this who uh, who are invited to that. So I want to I want to break this one off here now. But um, continue to uh, to think about these parts. I'm I'm going to uh, update us on where we are at now. It sounds like what's clear is that we want to have some kind of closed loop version of of the model in six months. So we have to figure out how to break that out. We want to organize ourselves in subgroups, so that's clear. Um, and um, and we, but we don't want to necessarily stop the things that we're doing right now. Uh, we want to continue to build out <clears throat> the basic uh, data and the data integration. So things like synapse positions are important. Uh, Balash is going to um, help frame some of these simulation activities with his sort of Turing test uh, document manifesto. So we'll look forward to that, and, and thank you very much for that. Um, and then, um, yeah, we'll figure out how to how to take what we have now with the cyber elegance and figure out how to how to use it as a spec or adapt it or port it um, into the next uh, into the next version uh, that we're building. Okay. So thanks all for joining. I'm going to start up this other I'm going to start up this other meeting now. So I'm going to quit this one. Um, if you decide that you do want to join it and you're not on the invite list of the other one, just drop me a note or chat, um, and I'll add you. But uh, for now, thanks, everybody, for taking the time uh, to meet today. Uh, we'll have another one probably in about two weeks. Um, it's probably the same time. Um, and then we'll see, uh, we'll see where we're at. Hopefully, we'll have some uh, meetings of the subgroups uh, already uh, before that next, uh, that next uh, big joint meeting. Okay? okay. Take Thank care, you. guys. You guys rock. Right. Right. See ya. Bye-bye.